people attending. So thanks again for attending this webinar on advancing public health with wearables and the strategic development of those IMOT, IOMT, Biosensing Lifestyle Devices. And that acronym means the Internet of Medical uh, Devices. So uh, it's being hosted by myself, Chris Montalbano, the CEO of MIDI Medical Product Development. And also uh, hosting with me is Ryan. Hey, Chris, Ryan Crodel here from Valencell. And uh, we're pleased to uh, bring this presentation to you on the, uh, these uh, wearable Internet of Things devices for the medical market. So again, there's going to be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. So feel free to send in any questions through the Zoom chat tool as we're going through the uh, presentation itself. So first, uh, we're going to uh, describe what MIDI is all about and what we do. And then Ryan's going to describe uh, what valence cell is all about and often midi and valence cell team together on the development of wearable wearable medical devices so midi is expert in medical innovation we have over 45 years of development experience uh, a staff of uh, over 30 people with cross-functional teams across various disciplines from mechanical to uh, manufacturing engineering electrical engineering and software programming and then the whole usage ceremony industrial design side of things so we've completed decades of successful healthcare and medical products, clocked many hours in global research, a voice of the customer is related to programs, and we use a proprietary process we call development DNA, which is, infuses innovation and competitive differentiation into our clients' devices, uh, but also conforms with the FDA QSR and ISO 1345. So we could go for a 510K or an FDA approval on the device itself at the end of the day. Uh, our process is very DFX focused, meaning designed for manufacture, designed for assembly. So we're optimizing margins during the development uh, and believers in program management and communication across the board. So concept of production from sourcing, qualifying and managing those contract manufacturers. Good. Um, yeah, thanks, Chris. And just a quick summary of, of Valence Health for those of you not familiar with our company before we dive in. Um, Valence Health makes the, the biometric sensor technology that goes into wearable devices, uh, specifically the PPG or photoplethysmography sensors that, that go into all kinds of different wearable devices. And uh, we've been at that for more than a decade now. So uh, before the word wearables existed, let alone the, the whole market that exists today, um, much of which has been in the consumer wearable sector, just given that's where the market grew up. But um, in the last few years, as this convergence has accelerated between consumer wearables and health and medical devices, uh, Valence Cell's been uh, sort of in the middle of that, enabling consumer wearable devices to get uh, clinical grade accuracy and, and medical device um, companies and, and healthcare companies uh, building devices intended to be worn outside of a medical facility and enabling sensor technology in, um, in those types of devices. So um, you can always get more information at, at valencell.com if you're interested or feel free to reach out to me directly. I'll, we'll have our contact information at the end of the presentation here. So uh, in terms of an agenda, real quick, just to, to outline what we'll cover here in the next hour or so. Well, as Chris mentioned, there, there will be Q&A at the end and we're, we're gonna leave uh, hopefully plenty of time for a lot of Q&A and a lot of uh, interactive discussion. Uh, but what we're gonna cover in terms of the prepared materials is um, an overview, a look at what are uh, medical wearables and, and um, some examples, how those different wearables are getting categorized, the sensor landscape within those, those wearable devices, which obviously drives a, a great deal of the capabilities, the use cases, and, and ultimately the uh, patient outcomes from these devices. And, and we'll focus on two predominant areas of that, um, uh, those types of devices, those driven by biosensing and, and those driven by um, uh, physiological measurements. Um, and, and then as Chris mentioned before, um, they have a tremendous amount of experience in 
um, in uh, develop the, developing these devices from scratch. And so uh, we'll go through some of um, those lessons learned and be best practices that are encompassed, encompassed in um, what they call the innovation roadmap. Um, and then we will also um, highlight uh, specifically some, some use cases and case studies uh, of uh, examples of these devices that we haven't already covered in some of those other topic areas. So um, with that, I will hand back over to Chris to uh, kick us off here with the, the first slide. Thanks, Ryan. So uh, what are uh, Internet of Medical Thing wearables? So these wearables are network physiological sensing and biosensing smart devices that are intimately engaged with the body, measuring key parameters and providing important contextual information from the human body, generally used outside of medical facilities. So simultaneously metric data is collected and analyzed at the device in the smartphone app or cloud apps for the benefit of providing health service insight to the user or healthcare provider. So as related to that, to encourage use and compliance, it's imperative that the device be embraced by the user as a lifestyle device, allowing them to use it in their daily environment, whether it's home, work, and transit or away. Now, as far as example use cases, so uh, devices like this help address uh, chronic disease management like diabetes, uh, remote patient monitoring, for example, collecting health metrics like heart rate, blood pressure, temperature, blood oxygenation from patients who are not physically present at healthcare facilities. Uh, diabetes management uh, is another example, continuous glucose monitoring that trigger an insulin injection. Or Parkinson's disease, the collection of continuous data about the severity of those symptoms and how they fluctuate over time and that mitigates the need for extended stays at hospital or for observation. Also, it helps uh, examples, uh, it helps address depression management uh, with the collection and analyzing of data such as heart rate and blood pressure, which can infer information about a patient's mental state. Remote diagnostics are very important in this, in this field. So in this instance, we're talking about not telemedicine, but telediagnostics. Uh, and then clinical trials, uh, pharmaceutical companies uh, look to collect information to analyze the impact of medications on patients more rigor rigorously and accurately, enhancing a personalized medicine approach that accelerates clinical trials. Now, the, the benefits of these devices, uh, to mention a few, for example, enabling new ways of engaging and empowering patients. So with a service-centric solution that addresses the needs of both the patient, but remember the provider and the payer also. Uh, improved efficiency, so it improves the latency and the gaps in the measurement versus treatment that formerly existed when interaction and measurements were only occurring in an office setting. Also accelerates feedback loops, uh, supportive of personalized patient care, enhancing patient outcomes. So that accelerates the recovery time and prevents rehospitalization. Clinical grade diagnostics outside a clinical setting and also provides new insights from longitudinal data sets and the integration of contextual information, providing critical insights and empowering enhanced decision making via mining, managing and analyzing a population of patient data that's been, of course, de identified due to HIPAA compliance. Now, again, still as related to the Internet of Medical Things wearables, uh, it's important to think about the categorization of those devices. So they fall into two buckets. One is consumer health wearables. Okay, so they're, uh, the definition of that, they're used basically for personal general wear wellness or fitness, such as activity trackers or smartwatches and smart bands. And these devices are not making clinical determination of your health. Uh, as a matter of fact, they provide data so the user can be informed and self-directed, enhancing their lifestyle and wellness goals. And again, remember, they are not FDA regulated. But the second bucket, the clinical grade wearables, okay? So these are used in conjunction with expert advice from a healthcare provider. And these devices 
aid in making clinical determination of your health, providing data so the provider can make evaluations. So they generally need to be certified or approved for use by one or more regulatory authorities, such as the FDA. So uh, just a note, in July 2016, the FDA issued a guidance document dealing with this topic called the FDA guidance document on general awareness products. And it was to address the growing market of wellness devices. So in there, it talks about how the FDA defines general wellness products based on two criteria. One, intended for only general wellness use. And two, presents a low risk to the safety of the user and other persons. Now, also they mentioned that the guidance uh, is as related to intended use. Number one, the intended use relates to maintaining or encouraging a general state of health or healthy activity. And two, an intended use that relates to the role of a healthy lifestyle with helping to reduce the risk of certain chronic diseases or conditions. So the FDA maintains that they will not regulate general wellness products, or you could call them quote unquote consumer health wearables, but those devices, as long as they do not make claims about disease prevention, treatment, mitigation, or cure, but rather claim to sustain or offer general improvement to the conditions associated with the general state of health. Uh, and Chris, if I may, just one comment on that. Um, it, it's, um, it's getting harder and harder to draw definitive lines between um, these devices as uh, this convergence that I mentioned is, is continuing to accelerate between consumer and, and true medical devices. You just look at examples like the Apple Watch or Fitbit, or I guess now Google um, devices where uh, there are FDA cleared capabilities within those devices but they are not necessarily prescribed by a provider and they are uh, able to be purchased directly by consumers without a prescription or, or any other caregiver guidance. So there's the, it's getting harder and harder to draw definitive lines um, here. And I think you'll see more and more of that uh, going on. But um, uh, similarly, um, it, when we look at the sensor landscape that's embedded into these, um, these devices, and I'll preface this by saying this is by no means a comprehensive list. There are um, numerous other sensor modalities and, and types of different sensor technology that's being uh, embedded into wearable devices of all kinds. Um, and what we will focus on just in the interest of time here, we will focus on uh, the most common types of sensor modalities that are going into um, uh, wearable medical devices today. And that's more in the optical and chemical realm uh, that we will uh, talk further about here. But I, I wanted to, to kind of set the context here in that um, they, these are by far the most common types of sensor modalities going into uh, wearable devices and, and specifically health and medical wearables. Uh, but certainly um, not the only um, sensor modalities there. And in fact, you're starting to see um, sensor fusion as uh, sensor fusion in terms of multiple sensor modalities in, um, in one device to try to um, get multiple angles of, uh, of interrogation and um, data sources to understand uh, how an individual's body is responding to uh, what they're going through, and then also to apply those different perspectives from different sensor modalities towards uh, different um, uh, diagnostics or therapeutics or, uh, or even just uh, general health and wellness activities. So uh, what we're going to get into now is describing, uh, as Ryan mentioned, there are two areas we're going to focus on. Uh, the first we're going to go into now, the biosensory device overview, wearable medical biosensory devices. So a biosensory device are made up of transducers with biological elements. The bioelement interacts with the analyte, or you could call that the biological sample, being tested. So that interaction generates a biological reaction, which is converted into an electrical signal by the transducer. So just to follow that, that workflow here. So again, uh, we have the analyte, the biological sample that could be sweat, saliva, interstitial fluid, 
tears, breath, the biological element, which is designed into the, the package uh, supplied with that biosensor fall into three categories. There's the uh, biocatalytic group uh, comprising of enzymes. There's the bioaffinity group, including antibodies and nucleic acids. And there's the microbase containing microorganisms. Now, when you combine those two, and by the way, the biological sample is usually obtained when you're dealing with a wearable in a non-invasive or at least minimally invasive way with microneedles, let's say. So when you combine that analyte with the biological element, you're going to get a biological reaction. Uh, so you'll get a signal produced. It will be either electrical or optical or thermal, for example. And then depending upon the transducer you design, with that appropriate transducer, it converts that biological reaction into a measurable electrical parameter, current or voltage as such, uh, so that you can then uh, acquire that data and then process it. So the clinical objective of this device is then to compare that data collected to known biomarkers, which will provide indication of a condition or chronic disease and or the body's response to a chronic treatment of a condition or chronic disease. Now, here are some uh, examples of biosensory devices currently under development within the industry. So this is a graphene-based sweat sensor array for diabetes monitoring applied to the uh, forearm. Uh, this is an example of a wearable chemical electrophysiological hybrid sensor configuration for real-time health and fitness monitoring with uh, screen printed electrodes on it. Uh, this is uh, an integrated wearable sensor array band for multiplex sweat extraction and analysis applied to the wrist with a sensor array. And the device provides simultaneous detection of chloride, sodium, and glucose in sweat. And the sweat is induced via electrical stimulation. So when you're, you're pulling off sweat, it's important to note that you may not be sweating at all times. So you may need to induce that. And that's how that's addressed. Uh, this is a, a floor metric skin interface microfluidic platform for the measurement of chloride, sodium, and zinc. Again, uh, this uh, utilizes uh, exercise induced sweat. So it didn't electrically induce it like over here. And a mouth guard based wearable uh, uric acid biosensing platform. So that's has integrated wireless electronics to analyze that uric acid uh, in your saliva. Just to mention some other wearable uh, applications include uh, continuous glucose monitoring, cholesterol monitoring, fertility tracking, cancer detection, treatment, infection, disease detection, and detecting cardiovascular diseases. So what are the challenges of uh, designing for devices like this? Um, just to mention a few. So correlating blood biomarkers with biosample analyte biomarkers. So considerable validation work still remains to, to develop a reliable correlation between the biomarkers derived from blood samples, meaning the golden standard, and those obtained by sampling various externally accessible biosample analytes. Now, again, uh, what would these analytes be or these samples? So we talked about tears and interstitial fluid. Now, those biomarkers correlate well with blood biomarkers. When it comes to sweat, it requires additional studies to provide a strong correlation. But saliva, while correlating well, it has low concentrations of biomarkers. So that's one challenge and also external factors which can influence the test, like food particles and undesirable biofouling materials. So those are some things to take into account with this challenge. As far as calibration, developing pro proper methods of calibrating the device in a passive manner is very important. So it's not like a diagnostic piece of equipment in a lab where you're trained on how to calibrate. It needs to be black boxed and passive to the user. And then proper use and compliance, the challenge of that. So we need to optimize this wearable and the compliance through proper lifestyle human factors engineering design. So to achieve efficacy, a wearable has to encourage proper use and compliance 
through direct contact with the body and or biosample analyte without inducing comfort to the wearer. So compliance can be achieved through proper lifestyle human factors engineering and the use of advanced materials and intelligent ergonometric design, providing the necessary scalability on human form and the flexibility for lifestyle motion. And then as related to sample transport and evaporate mitigation and the challenge thereof, realize when dealing with small quantities of sample, for example, sweat, uh, to get that sample to the reaction zone of the device requires the bio a bio sample to be in, uh, induced. So often extraneous exercise does not pair well with the patient's lifestyle or time of day when that sweat sample needs to be acquired. So in these conditions, as we previously mentioned, sweat could be induced via electrical stimulation. So that would be one example of a mitigation or more properly set a proper design in the system. Great, so now um, we will take a look at the, um, the physiological sensor category and, and effectively what we're talking about here is the non-invasive, truly non-invasive measurement of physiological parameters and, uh, and vital signs produced by the body. And there's a variety of different examples of these physiological parameters, everything from brain activity measured by an EEG to body temp and pulse ox and blood pressure. Uh, these are, are fairly commonly known uh, physiological parameters that are, um, are, are able to be measured by wearable devices today. So Chris, if you wouldn't mind going into some of the more specific examples, um, these are some examples of devices in the market today, everything from uh, what many people perceive as the, the or commonly known as the, the, the uh, largest category of wearable devices in terms of smartwatches and fitness bands and, uh, and even um, audio earbuds. But you're also seeing, uh, particularly as it relates to the wearable sensor technology, this technology getting embedded into uh, clinical medical devices and, and even consumer devices like AR and VR headsets used in clinical medical settings to do things like pain management or, um, uh, or stress monitoring and stress management. Um, hearing health is another, uh, another good example of um, an area that is representative of this convergence going on between consumer wearables and, and health and medical devices. You're, you're starting to see more of the consumer audio uh, companies adding more and more hearing augmentation capabilities that have traditionally been in the context of uh, true hearing aids or hearing health devices. And, and uh, on the flip side, you're starting to see these uh, hearing aid companies and hearing health devices adding more and more capabilities uh, like activity tracking and uh, biometric sensing and the, these types of capabilities that have traditionally been considered more wearable capabilities. So it's an interesting micro, microcosm, if you will, of, of what's going on more broadly. Um, and so to, to dive into some of these more specific uh, examples and, and use cases, um, one of which is um, intensive care and, and uh, post-op uh, evaluations. From an intensive care standpoint, there there's a significant focus on eliminating as many of the invasive monitors as possible because of um, insertion challenges and removal challenges, uh, infection risk, et cetera. You, you're, you, you, there's a big interest in um, doing as much of this monitoring non-invasively as possible. Just as a quick example, um, uh, blood pressure monitoring during um, intensive care or, or even during uh, operations. Uh, the, the traditional uh, gold standard method is, uh, of course, an arterial line, uh, and, and there's a great deal of interest and traction in, in monitoring blood pressure in those situations non-invasively uh, using what are effectively wearable sensors. Um, so that's in the intensive care area. Post-operatively, of course, the, the, the primary focus is preventing readmission by catching early warning signs of deterioration before um, a patient would require full readmission into the hospital or, or healthcare facility. And of course, there's 
uh, regulatory uh, penalties and considerations that are, are driving uh, a great deal of that. But um, today you can, um, uh, you can monitor many of the key vital signs post-operatively while an individual is at home or going about their, their daily activities um, where they, they don't necessarily have to, to stay uh, in the four walls of a hospital or health, healthcare facility. Uh, and those things can be monitored uh, with high acuity in that key uh, post-operative period or, or post-discharge period. Um, next, uh, so uh, obviously the, the pandemic environment driven by COVID-19 was, uh, was brutal on a, on a lot of levels. And if there were any silver linings, I would say one of them uh, maybe that it certainly showcased the capabilities of current wearable technology that exists in the marketplace today, the hundreds of millions of units that are in the field today, um, demonstrated the capabilities to provide uh, an early warning system, if you will, for, um, uh, for not just COVID-19 infection, but, um, but indication of uh, fighting an infection, fighting a virus, um, physiological stress of some kind, and, and certainly showed a lot of promise for the future because uh, it, the, a lot of what was highlighted with, um, within the pandemic environment was current capabilities, and in some cases, years old sensor technology and, and wearable technology that uh, is in the field today. Um, and so it, it also really showed a lot of promise for the future of, of leveraging this technology as a, as a mass market, broad scale, uh, early warning system, if you will, not just for, um, uh, for viral infections and the tracking of, of those, um, uh, those infection rates and, and the location of those uh, infection rates, but but also just overall um, tracking individual personal health and wellness and establishing more of a personalized baseline, if you will, and indicating or, or providing um, uh, warnings when there's a deviation from that, that personal baseline. So Chris, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide, I think, um, I think this is one you're gonna cover. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Ryan. Um, so again, as related to wearable physiological sensors and devices, another uh, key application is neurotechnology. So this uh, growing field of bioelectronic medicine has demonstrated that our body is a bio circuit uh, and such that if you induce uh, neuromodulation via electrical stimulus at the appropriate locations on the body, you could induce a prescribed reaction to achieve that clinical outcome. So where applicable, a closed loop system will automatically adapt to the patient's clinical state and can enhance the efficacy of a therapy. So for example, you know, observing directly how the, the brain reacts, let's say an EEG reading to a stimulation in real time with utilization of an algorithm and stimulation refinement provides for that physiological state optimization. Uh, and some applications, just a sampling of some applications include uh, mitigating uh, chronic uh, pain, uh, resting seizures uh, like an epilepsy, Parkinson's disease, uh, in that instance, enhancing motor function for those people, uh, improving mood disorder, uh, and mitigating the effects of drug withdrawal symptoms like uh, for uh, uh, opioids. Uh, and in this particular device, uh, Ryan and I are gonna go into some hands-on case studies. Uh, this is the stem clip uh, that provides certain uh, mitigations in the body that we'll get into uh, shortly. Uh, now, ju just like we went through the biosensing category of uh, applications and challenges. We're going to do that now for the wearables on physiological sensors. So what are some other applications? You know, uh, these devices could address hypertension mitigation, stress mitigation, heart disease monitoring, dementia mitigation, uh, predicting migraine attacks, assessment of treatments and the efficacy thereof, monitoring rehabilita rehabilitation in the elderly, and then sports medicine. 
So it's related to some of the challenges of this device. And all these challenges can be mitigated through proper design, which is what we're gonna get into in a second. The, how do you go about designing devices like this? Uh, so one of the challenges is proper contact with the body. So maintaining intimate yet comfortable contact with the targeted zones of the body are very important. In addition, the accuracy of the body location is particularly sensitive in certain applications like in neuromodulation devices. So uh, also power consumption, uh, maximizing uptime yet minimizing battery size and being strategic with that. So as related to that, uh, sensors are known to be power hungry. So you could optimize the duty cycles from an engineering perspective as related to data processing and, and mitigating power consumption, being strategic about the data collection with post-processing and apps to save on the power on the device. And then wireless communication to mitigate that power consumption, selecting the most efficient uh, technology that pairs well with the user and the usage ceremony. For example, uh, low energy Bluetooth. In some instances, you can't do that. You need to go cellular, but it depends on the usage ceremony. And then having various sleep modes in the electronics to configure multiple states to conserve on energy. The, these two should be major bullets here, but jumping to the next challenge is ruggedizing. So ruggedization to ensure lifestyle situations with high IP ratings, that means ingress protection ratings. And the last major challenge, just to mention a few, is the cybersecurity and HIPAA compliance. So often you could address that through, you, you don't have to engineer the encryption from scratch. There are products out there you could buy or packages like MedCrypt. So you can include that in your proper design to encrypt that data. Now, and Chris, if I may jump in just to add a point there that I wouldn't necessarily call it a challenge, more of an opportunity, which is um, beyond the device itself, um, creating a compelling user experience to um, utilize the, the data that's produced by these devices in, uh, in a compelling way that creates actionable information for the user of the technology, whether that's the the individual wearing the device or the healthcare provider or perhaps both or uh, other people um, involved. It's um, at the end of the day, these devices are data collection endpoints. And what, um, what matters as much or more than the device itself is what you do with that data and how you turn that data into actionable information to solve a problem, whether that's um, helping someone just with their general wellness or managing a specific disease or even a symptom of a, uh, of a specific disease. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the challenges uh, in, in the design and engineering world are, are viewed as a, a call to action to, to come up with optimized solutions to not only mitigate it, but to extend beyond and to really enhance the design and, and put in place competitive differentiation and potentially patentable features with the design. So that, that brings in mind the, the innovation roadmap, the three stops to that. So, so how do you go about or approach uh, taking all of this direction and then having it manifest itself into actionable direction from a development perspective? So we call it the roadmap because there are three stops along this journey, the roadmap. Stop one, uh, discovery research and uncovering healthcare opportunities. Stop two, technology innovation, the agile R&D process, and stop three, which is all about commercialization and implementation. So th this innovation roadmap is part of MIDI's development DNA methodology and allows for strategic development of the Internet of Medical Thing wearables, yielding innovation and competitive differentiation while addressing the challenges of these devices. So if we go to the first stop, the discovery research, uncovering healthcare opportunities. So it kicks off with that research, uncovering the, the wearable healthcare needs of the, the various stakeholders from the, the patient to the providers, to the payers. Uh, and it's conducted through many hours of global user-driven research with having past knowledge under our belt, but also that you know collecting fresh firsthand future knowledge and, and we go in and we identify, and it's important for anyone to do it in this way, to identify the differences in the needs of those key 
uh, stakeholders that I just mentioned. Uh, also, there's public service like with COVID and potentially the farmer groups to take into account. And those stakeholder interviews and documentation defining a new value proposition, a value handshake between the stakeholders and your company so that there's a, uh, whether you're collecting data and then pushing that and, and, and then transferring that into new direction for the end user to improve their health and lifestyle, this is what, what it's about. So the user interaction and environmental observation in a field context is very important to address that lifestyle and compliance on the usability. And this is done by performing workflow analysis, task mapping, usage ceremony analysis, both physically with the wearable, but also digitally, because you have the apps in the cloud for the internet of things to make sure that's simple and that you're presenting the minimal core amount of information necessary. Uh, doing this with the discovery research and systems analysis. So all of this creates methods for informed actionable development strategies. Now, once that information is collected, moving to the next stop, stop two, the technology innovation and the agile R&D process. So this is where that collected information starts to manifest itself in the form of proof of concepts. So it's, it's a time to explore and come up with different configurations at a lab level, but then introducing that back to the end user from a validation perspective. So it uh, involves technology and innovation and IP development, which creates product protection for the, for the manufacturer. We look at the technology and methodology and material research to evaluate and select and test. And, and we'll get into that more in a, in a next slide. There's an IP engine created, uh, meaning an intellectual property engine created, so cr creating new patents and process protection. The, again, all under the development DNA, but these proof of concepts and the iterations of this are very important. So creating a quality feedback loop with the quality first process and doing it in an agile fashion taking those proof of concepts and also doing external human factors engineering testing and optimizing that stakeholder adoption and user compliance via heuristic analysis, meaning the human factors engineering biomechanics and analysis, and then formative studies using those proof of concepts for the formative studies, and then using and mining the user experience, the user interface and that data in wireframing to provide for decision making when introducing those those wireframes of the apps and the cloud to the end users in particular up front. Yeah, and so within that, I thought this was this may be a good time to um, think about um, how we approach at, at Valence all this um, this process and. Um, look at it from um, uh, from another perspective around um, bringing these these devices to market in a way that um, that creates that that compelling uh, user experience and and solves the solves the problem that it's intended to solve and and really everything um, on the the right hand side of this slide we that that's under that user experience. Um, uh, label here is um, the, the output from stop one that, that Chris described. And, and it sounds pretty um, uh, straightforward or um, common sense, but it, um, we continually remind uh, uh, the, the, um, the organizations we work with around to, to really start with the end in mind. What is that user experience you want to create and work backwards from there? So uh, as an example, um, to if you're trying to create a specific user experience, you need to understand what are the assessments, the physiological assessments that are needed in order to generate that user experience or that patient experience. And from there, what are the key metrics, the, the physiological metrics directly measured uh, from the body that feed those assessments to create that patient experience? And then from there, look at Okay, what are the right, what's the right sensor technology? What are the right sensor modalities that we need in order to generate those metrics and those assessments to fulfill that that patient experience? And um, it, it's very easy to jump into the left hand side of this slide, this um, diagram, if you will, and 
and say, oh, we need this sensor or that sensor, or we need to measure this or that without really thinking about how that's gonna come together in the end in uh, the patient experience and the, the user experience. So we strongly encourage the, the, um, the organizations that we work with to really start with that end in mind. And it's, it's almost cliche, but it's cliche for a reason because it's true. You really do need to, to keep that, that end in mind and work backwards from there. So moving to, to stop three, uh, commercialization and implementation, preparing for market under the regulatory controls. So the third stop of this innovation roadmap is not only the cumulative and final stop of the development process, but the most detailed and involved as well, entailing the commercialization and implementation of the device and development. And it's the stage at which regulatory guidelines such as the FDA, QSR, and ISO 1345 must finally be put into action, utilizing the data that was gathered at stop one and stop two activities. So MIDI does not view stop three as being constrained, uh, let's say constrained by the FDA, but rather as a method of being systematic and well-documented, allowing for process standardization thus freeing our teams to focus on implementing and commercializing the development innovations. So using processes such as these, you mitigate your staff's documentation burden requirements, allowing them to focus on the engineering and design commercialization of a creative, innovative device. So achieving this standardization requires the use of robust quality management system or known as a QMS. And at MIDI, our QMS is our development DNA approach. Now, uh, in this approach, you have to accommodate, obviously, planning, design controls and risk management, verification and validation, having a design history file and design review meetings, all fed from the stop one and stop two information. But we're still operating under an agile development sprint, creating alpha prototypes with, that are verified and beta prototypes, aka pilot production, that are verified and validated. So. What follows next in the slide deck are the strategic development disciplines and methods deployed when creating those wearables. So usability, meaningful product relationships. So it's very important to stay user focused and, and address the formative studies with the human factors engineering and the internet of medical things for the UX, UI and data on the apps in the cloud with those summative usability studies with the design validation under the appropriate regulatory document guidelines. It's also very important, the industrial design, the innovation breakthroughs. So, so the usability, as I, as I mentioned on the previous slide, is designing it to make sure that it's intimate with the body, encouraging compliance. The industrial design side is more about the lifestyle side of things and encouraging compliance. People want to wear it. They want to be able, they want to be seen with it. Uh, they don't want to feel that it's something that will not blend in with who they are and what they're about. So these are some of the tools and methods we use to address the industrial design from human factors engineering to form factor design, the aesthetics, and, and weaving that into the engineering side of things. And then on the engineering, what we're explaining is this is the uh, embedded system approach to the uh, electrical engineering boards that are made. And this is the firmware and software approach to approaching that using tools like Altium and doing the schematics and the layout, selecting the appropriate wireless communication that feeds in with the usage ceremony and lifestyle analysis for that particular target market. Uh, and then programming for that at a chipset level and then at the app level and then at the cloud level but more on the internet of things, that development of a transformative user experience and user interface. So very, very important uh, as related to the apps in the cloud and the connectivity back to your device. So it's a very user centric approach uh, with the mapping and enveloping the user in an ecosystem. Uh, so view it as a service component of the device that's being worn. And again, all data needing to comply with HIPAA and the FDA regulations. It's a very data-driven approach to create a service-centric business model, looking at the devices at hubs of interaction and not nodes or endpoints. And real-time mining of the user experience and user interface data is very important 
to enhance the service centric model. So addressing all of the stakeholders, the caregivers, the patients, the payers and the providers in this ceremony. And then the engagement needs to be simple, doing that workflow and task analysis and wireframing and validating early on before you have your software programmers start to go off and program it. Yep, and one other area that is that we've found to be critical over the years is um, is testing these devices early and often in the product development cycle. Um, it, it, people are different; everybody is different, and especially when you're looking at physiological and biosensing, um, uh, different bodies react to these sensors in different ways, and so you got to make sure that not just the sensor technology, but the, the entire uh, device at a system level uh, is working the same on a broad spectrum of the population, uh, same as it does um, in the lab or, or on the bench. And so um, uh, just it, as one example, uh, we at Valencell have uh, created what we call our, a, a biometrics testing lab here at our headquarters. And it's a critical part of what we do to serve as a, as a check and a balance against our um, our own um, R and D and development team to make sure that um, what the the performance that they're seeing again on the bench is is what we're seeing when it's actually used in practice on uh, on real people doing the intended use case, uh, but it also um, it, it also serves as a, a way to. Um, uh, to test out uh, and um, iterate on uh, our customers' early prototypes of, of their devices and provide some valuable feedback on uh, perhaps some design changes or, or development changes that, uh, that could be made in, um, again, in the, in the early prototyping phase to help optimize the, the performance of that device. And then, of course, we're also testing um, a variety of different non-valence cell technologies that are out there on the marketplace to uh, make sure that um, uh, that we're staying ahead of the game, if you will. But also just to understand how the, these different sensor technologies uh, perform for the intended use case and for alternate use cases, as we're seeing more and more of these devices. Um, being uh, positioned and and um, and tried to be used as uh, maybe off-label or um, beyond the intended uh, use case for the initial development. So, um, at a high level, we just we encourage everyone to to test these uh, wearable devices early and often for the intended use case on a broad spectrum of the population. Uh, you know, different genders, fitness levels, skin tones, et cetera, to make sure that, that um, this works for a broad spectrum of the population. Uh, so now we are gonna jump into a couple of case studies. I, I wanna be mindful of time here because we definitely wanna get to uh, the questions that have come in and that, that will come in. Um, so, Chris, if you wouldn't mind jumping to the next slide, I um, want to talk about a, a really innovative company called Sana Health that is um, using the mask that you see here. It looks like a little bit like a sleep mask, but actually what that is intended to do initially as a consumer general wellness device is, um, is uh, provide stress management and stress monitoring um, capabilities uh, for primarily for general wellness use cases. But the device was originally designed and it is going through uh, the FDA clearance process now as a pain management tool. And um, there's a variety of things that are interesting about this. One is the, the opioid crisis, particularly here in the US is, is a massive problem. And this, um, this device has the potential to make a real impact on uh, on that problem in providing a non-pharmaceutical approach to pain management. And the results they're seeing are, are on par with pharmaceuticals, not just when someone's wearing the device, but, but after they take it off as well. Um, another interesting thing here, and this is a, a common theme we're seeing as well, is using um, some of these more common wearable sensor technologies as a proxy or as a replacement for 
uh, maybe some of the more advanced or more high acuity um, uh, sensor technology. In this case, the team at, at SANA initially proved out their use case and initially developed their device with EEG sensors um, in, in this mask and, and around the head to, to uh, provide uh, a real-time biofeedback loop in, in how the individual was responding to the neuromodulation therapy that's encompassed in this headset. What they found though, was that the, the electrodes and the EEG sensors just um, weren't, um, weren't durable enough and, and weren't wearable enough, if you will, for, uh, for long-term usage in a, um, in a wearable device that, um, that uh, many people were gonna use for hopefully um, a, a long period of time. And so what they did is they, um, they switched out the EEG for a PPG sensor to do uh, measure heart rate variability, again, for that real-time biofeedback loop and in that neuromodulation experience. And, and that's proven to be a much more, uh, much more wearable and durable and scalable solution for, uh, for this technology. And um, late breaking news um, that I just saw very recently in the last few days, I think that this device has received um, uh, breakthrough device des designation specifically for fibromyalgia treatment by the FDA. And so um, it, it's, um, it's showcasing the, again, the capabilities of, of wearable sensor technology uh, applied to very real uh, uh, medical problems and challenges that are um, today being addressed in different ways and, and uh, in some cases ways that are, um, th that are proving detrimental at a, at a public health level in terms of the opioid crisis. Thanks, Ryan. Um, this next case study uh, is a device uh, MIDI created uh, in partnership with uh, Northwell Health's Feinstein Institute. Uh, it's known as the Stim Clip. Uh, it's a device that's worn on the ear uh, and stimulates the auricular branch of the vagus nerve. So based upon different proprietary stimulus protocols, it provides a method of treating patients with high blood pressure, depression, and tinnitus. It's paired with an app and utilizes biomarker information to provide for a closed loop feedback control system. So what was interesting in, in the development of this device and, and uh, Feinstein Institute is, is expert in this regard is related to uh, the development of uh, neuromodulation devices. Uh, we came in and uh, assisted with the, the uh, development and commercialization of the, the package system itself and what was key is obviously that it's worn on the ear. That was our target zone defined for us for a stimulation perspective, but a challenge from a human factors engineering perspective. And again, as, as Ryan mentioned, you embrace the challenges. You, you, you come up with unique designs in and around those challenges to address it. And as related to the ear, there were many degrees of freedom that we built in to allow for that proper contact the reason for the form is when you have the battery in there to make sure the center of gravity is over the center line of the ear. So you have a neutral state as related to the design. And also to mitigate needing to touch the device, it was totally controlled through the app. Uh, so this, this is a device we're uh, quite proud of. And uh, you know, it's something that uh, is uh, going to make a difference uh, in the world. Um, what we'd like to do now is... Uh, move to uh, Q&A. Let me uh, call the next slide up. It's for some reason, it's a little sluggish. There we go. And, uh, you know, just just some, uh, before we go into the Q&A, just some wrap up thoughts. Uh, you know, Ryan and I went through a lot of information. But, you know, when it comes down to it, Ryan and I were tossing around, you know, how do you, how do you wrap up such a, a presentation like this? And uh, we, we realize that it's important to note that, you know, device optimization matters, uh, but at the end of the day, it's the data that you collect and what you do with that data that is important for managing the physiological health of you, the biological health and the wellness lifestyle. Uh, and that's, that's something important 
that we'd like everyone to sort of uh, understand at the end of the day, that's what it's about. Um, and we, we had a bunch of questions come in uh, and we'd like to uh, go through those questions. Um, Ryan, you, you received the, uh, the email with those questions, right? Uh, I'm sure I did. I haven't gotten there yet, but uh, go ahead and get started as I open those up. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I was thinking the, uh, the, the last uh, three or the last two might be interesting for you from Jack and Mark. They're asking about mm -hmm. blood pressure monitoring and, and uh, things like that. Uh, but, but one question that came in is uh, from uh, Tara. Uh, the question is, where do you find your inspiration for innovation and does the FDA compliance damper this innovation? Uh, that's, that's a great question. I, I appreciate the, the input on that. Um, so just, just to let you know, this, this is something on everyone's mind and, and the way we look at it, it's sort of like a mindset. So we've configured our uh, development DNA process uh, to not only comply with the FDA, but also to yield that innovation and competitive differentiation. So we use it as, as inspiration. Uh, to design for optimizing workflows and usage ceremony and, and the way in which it, it applies to the body and, and which creates indirect, which creates competitive differentiation on the system. So we, we view the FDA requirements more of a, a method of how we, we structure the collection of the information and then the use of it through design controls and not something that uh, inhibits us. So thanks, thanks again, Tara, for that, that question. Uh, Ryan, one, one of the questions was uh, from Mark, are you sensing blood pressure from PPG alone and how do you validate with the FDA? Yeah, great question. So um, uh, there's a variety of different uh, companies and methodologies for doing cuffless blood pressure monitoring. We at, at Valence Cell uh, are focusing on measuring um, and monitoring blood pressure through PPG only. Uh, through our PPG sensor technologies. And we've now tested that technology on north of 5,000 patients, uh, close to five, about 20,000 data sets, uh, I think at this point. And um, so we are, uh, as far as validation goes, we validated that technology separate from our, uh, separate from our training data set. Um, we've, we've generated several test data sets uh, according to doing the data collection according to the ISO protocol, that ISO 81060-2. And, um, so, and we've actually published a white paper on that on our website if you're interested in, in seeing that validation data. Um, as far as the FDA goes, we will be going for uh, FDA uh, clearance on the technology later this year. So um, stay tuned on that. Another, another question that came in from uh, John, uh, I guess this question relates to when we were talking about the ISO 1345s and design controls, he asked, what tools do you use to track uh, design controls? Uh, so uh, MIDI, uh, their favorite tool is uh, Matrix Requirement, so Matrix ALM, it's a company in Europe, cloud-based tool. It's excellent as related to not only the design controls and the risk management and keeping track of it. And then it frees our people up uh, as related to traceability and all the signatures that are required because it's all electronic uh, and, and builds that file as you go, saving a lot of time and allowing us to focus more on the, on the innovation side of things. Um, and then Ryan, there was a question here from Jack, it says, tell me more about the status and quality of blood pressure biosensing, please. Um, well, so uh, I, I'll just expand a little bit on what I mentioned before. We at Valence Cell are focused on uh, cuffless blood pressure technology. A, a few things that are unique about that. One is that it is entirely calibration free. So um, as you probably know, even blood pressure cuffs require calibration, but we've really focused on in, in an effort to, to make this technology truly wearable and, and ultimately continuously monitoring and passive in a wearable device. 
we've really focused on this technology being uh, entirely calibration free. We do need to know four pieces of information about the individual, their age, height, weight, and gender. Uh, with those inputs, plus the inputs from the PPG and inertial sensors, we, um, we can generate uh, an estimation of blood pressure that, as I mentioned before, we've, we've validated against the ISO standard and, and shown to be on par with, uh, with a blood pressure cuff. And uh, we'll be taking that through the FDA process later this year. Um, and so just to, to really um, kind of set that in context, we see this as um, addressing a major public health concern. Uh, you're probably well aware, but there's over a billion people in the world that have hypertension and many of those people don't know they have it. So um, the idea, and they, they call um, hypertension or high blood pressure the silent killer because there are no outward symptoms of hypertension and high blood pressure. And it's, it is um, uh, a comorbidity associated with uh, numerous, um, in fact, the, the, um, uh, the many, many challenges with um, the, some of the highest uh, um, uh, areas where the, um, uh, the public health concerns around things like stroke and heart attack and others uh, blood pressure is, is almost always a comorbidity associated with that. So to the extent we can make this wearable and, um, and ideally passive in the background and identify these, these um, issues before they become uh, too far down the path of hypertension and, and the damage that that causes, the better. And so ultimately, that's where we see this going as is uh, a, the ability to, to do so uh, and to measure and monitor your blood pressure in devices that you're already wearing. So uh, we, we have about uh, 25 more questions to go through, and I, I know we're running short on time. We're going to get to all, answer all of your questions, and we will definitely follow up with all of you offline. But we wanted to uh, thank you for your time. Uh, we appreciate this opportunity of uh, presenting this slide deck to you and this subject, and uh, it's, it's been great. And Thanks, everyone. I appreciate your time and you sticking with us all the way through this. Yep, absolutely. And thanks again. And we'll follow up offline with an email with a link to the recorded session. Uh, so that you could all access it and, and watch it again at your own time. But thanks again. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.